Welcome to CEF Insights, your source for closed-end fund information and education brought to you by the Closed-End Fund Association. My name is Diane Merritt. Today we are joined again by Tom Rosine, Head of Research Services with Refinitive Lipper and author of the Fund Market Insight Report, which provides in-depth monthly commentary on the closed-end fund market. We're happy to have you with us today, Tom. Thanks for having me, Diane. Uh, it's great to be here. Tom, you recently published your report for June 2020, covering over 500 closed-end and interval funds. How did markets generally perform in June, and what was the impact on closed-end funds? Markets took us out on a roller coaster ride this week, and it really was due to some great news that we heard and some disappointing news. We basically started out the month on an up note, seeing that the unemployment rate dropped to 13.3% from 14.7% in May, and the main numbers basically came in 2.5 2.5 million jobs being added to the U.S. economy, while analysts thought there was uh, going to be a 7.3 million people decline. So those job increases actually set the tone. However, later in the month, we had to worry about new closures coming around because we had a spike in coronavirus cases. And basically, there was a pile put over the general economy as a whole. So we saw wild moves, 500 swings up, 500 points swing down in the Dow. And so this really set the standard. But investors also had to weigh against this new coronavirus cases that we had. Again, strong unemployment numbers coming in, basically the improvement there, but also it was the commitment by the Federal Reserve and the Department of Treasury to do whatever it takes to shore up the economy. And that really put us on some very good numbers. The average closed on fund rose 1.18% for the month. And on a market basis, it basically uh, rose about 0.83. Fixed income funds rose about 2.61% for the month on an AV basis and about 2% uh, on a market basis. So while we're still in negative territory, and again, remember, equity funds really took it on the chin uh, on a year-to-date basis. They're still down 13.67%. Fixed income funds are down 4.55%. For the second quarter, equity closed-end funds are up 18.27%. That's the best quarter since Q2 2009. And fixed income funds are up a whopping 8.48%, and that's the best quarter for them since Q3 2009. So really, the month and the quarter were still very strong. We had most of our great returns in the prior two months, but basically when we're taking a look at uh, the June numbers, they were good as well. Now, your data breaks out closed-end funds into over 20 classifications. What classifications were the best performing for the month and which sectors struggled? Let's start with kind of the big view, kind of see where we went. Basically, I'm going to give you some macro views. If we look at equity funds, the second month in a row, we saw world equity funds stay at the top of the charts. They produced about a 4% return on a NAV basis. Then we look at mixed asset funds. They were able to return 1.71% in June. And domestic equity funds, they got clobbered a little bit in an area, I'll I'll elaborate here, were up 0.2% for the month. Basically, what we saw for the equity universe is that people turn their attention towards foreign issues. So emerging market funds were up 5.64%. But we also had uh, convertible security funds that were benefiting from the lower interest rates and that opportunity to participate in a conversion if that's what they decided to do to get some equity returns out of 4.11%. And then we saw the developed market funds up 1.83%. Now, on the flip side, and this is where I was saying uh, domestic equity funds took a little one-two punch on this, the Energy Master Limited Partnership classification lost 5 0.87%. So energy MLP funds down 5.8%, and natural resources funds were down about 1.9%. So they dragged that domestic equity fund group down. Now, if we look on the fixed income side, the flight to safety was actually, uh, during the month, remember, started out good, and we heard more closes in the economy. We heard bars closing and the like, and then we had more cases of coronavirus increase. This flight to safety actually pushed bond funds up quite handsomely. And if we take a look on a kind of a play-by-play basis, we saw that emerging market debt funds were up about 5.17%, and U.S. mortgage funds were up 429 and high-yield munis were up 3.15. Now, if we take a look like I did on the other one, a macro group in this flight to safety, for the second consecutive month, world income funds were up 3.63%, muni bond funds were up 2.40%, and on the domestic fixed income side, they were up 2.63%, so handsome returns on the macro groups. Now, on the bottom side, we'll call them laggards. Nobody was in negative territory. Intermediate municipal debt funds were up 1.43%, and California municipal debt funds were up 1.54%. So those are the laggards of the fixed income group. But really, the good news to share with our investors and the like 
is all muni dip funds were in plus side column for the second consecutive month in a row. So again, strong return. I know it doesn't compare to the 18% and 14% we talked about on the equity side, but very strong returns for bond funds, bond closed-end funds uh, for the month of June. Is this a change in what you saw from May? It is. If you recall in May, we had this rally, if you will, in really underperforming classifications and issues out there. Basically, we saw the energy uh, MLP funds at the top and natural resources funds were at the top as well. I think many people recall that we had a rally in oil prices. Uh, it was like a 98% increase at one point. I mean, just huge numbers. And when you're going from 15 to 30, that's what happens, or 19 to you know 28, whatever the, the, the numbers were. But so we had that happen. Well, this month, the reality set in a little bit more. And so, again, we saw energy master limited partnerships or energy MLP funds be the big losers along with natural resources funds. So investors also kept, though, the pedal to the metal for the international or foreign issues. And we saw global and international funds actually do very well. So there were some similarities and some contrasts uh, that we could take a look at. Are you seeing these trends carry over into July? The trend that we saw was kind of elation still from the prior months, and then we saw people kind of enter this reality mode. The numbers started to climb. We saw wild swings. I think we're going to see a lot of swings in the market still, and really this is going to be, I think, a risk-off mode for investors. We've seen some big numbers come across. I think people are going to take a breather here and keep a close eye on the COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations as we go. So the continuation will, I think, be kind of the choppiness that we saw. Um, yesterday, we saw some big losses in the market. And I, I think what we're going to see is the kind of this back and forth as investors evaluate, first of all, the Treasury and the Fed, their mantra of doing anything they can to keep the economy going versus this rise in the coronavirus cases that are out there. Closed-end funds can trade at a premium or a discount to net asset value. What were the trends in premium discount behavior? In general, we saw that the uh, all closed-end funds, we put them together, we don't care about fixed income or uh, equity uh, styles, we saw that all the median discount actually widened about 30 basis points. What I mean by widened, it got deeper, or worsened, uh, ending up at about 9.41% at the end of June, so on June 30th. Equity funds also saw a widening of their discounts, 15 basis points, about 11.92. And fixed income funds actually witnessed the largest widening, 34 basis points to 8.5% discount. Now, those numbers, you know, again, we saw some wild swings. We look at them on a daily basis, but those were the closing median discounts that were applied for the NAV and the market price. How do premiums and discounts compare to their historical averages? The median discount of 9.41%, uh, kind of quoted that for the overall group again, so I'm going to give you overall numbers. Uh, they were higher than our 12 month rolling median discount average. And, and, and this is hard. We, we like to look at the midpoints. We look at the median discount. And what I did is I took an, a 12 month rolling average, and that came out to be 7.33%. So it's still much higher on an average. So we're seeing an increase in discounts as we roll on in the months uh, from a, a year ago. And basically, in a year ago, when we were taking a look at that numbers on 731-2019, we had a median discount of 5.65%, and that was 111 closed-in funds that were traded on a premium. And then as of June 30th, 2020, we saw that this median discount for June 30th, again, was 9.41%, and only 71 of the closed-in funds out there were trading at a premium to their NAV. And so that was about a 400 basis point swing between a year ago and today. So the numbers are, are still showing a little more pessimism and a widening in the general closed-end fund arena. Which sector saw the greatest change? I mean, this bond fund saw the largest widening of discounts, only 74 basis points to 8.88%. But world income funds, remember I told you that investors really were turning on uh, their focus back towards uh, emerging markets, emerging market debt, developed market closed-end funds and the like. So basically, world income funds on this case saw the largest narrowing or improvement in their discounts, 248 basis points to 5.92%. Tom, areas of the market and economy have improved, but there are still some economic uncertainties raising concerns for investors. Are there sectors where investors may find particular opportunities given where those funds are trading relative to their historical averages? 
There are, and I'd like to put this with a caveat. We have seen, again, a spectacular run-up for the quarter, even though the numbers for June were a little bit lower, and, and I'm going to call them normal. I love it when I have 1.8% return for the month. So I'm, I'm afraid a lot of people are looking at the fear of missing out. I think it's been the quote that everybody has been saying that might have been driving this rally. But that said, if we take a look at the numbers, basically on a year-to-date basis, uh, we're taking a look at the average equity fund is down 13.67%. Fixed income funds are down 4.55%. And if we do believe that the Fed will do whatever it takes to keep the economy rolling, that reopenings will start to happen. And in fact, uh, we're seeing an increase in production and utilization and the like. I think there are some opportunities. The two biggest funds that are down, the closed end fund classifications that are down right now are Energy Master Limited Partnerships, so Energy MLP funds are down 58.54%. I'm a little hesitant on that group just because there's some rule changes going on and, and uh, you know, uh, how they're structured as uh, limited partnerships. There's some questions there. But natural resources funds are down 35.99%. There might be some opportunity there. Keep an eye on oil and gas. And utility funds are down 16.33%, and emerging market funds are down 12.87% for the year-to-date period. So I'm giving you these negative numbers. Say we do have some reason to think that it's going to come back. How fast it'll be? You know, are we in a V shape or are we in a U shape or W shape? To you know, recovering the economy. We don't know. But one area we have been looking at with interest is sector equity funds uh, are only down 3.36%. And one of the reasons is people have turned their attention to both technology and health and biotechnology uh, type of issues. So there may be an opportunity there, but keep in mind, they have recovered a lot of their losses that they witnessed on a year-to-date basis. Tom, you also follow interval funds, which typically offer limited quarterly liquidity to investors. Often the portfolios of these funds include investments that are not plain vanilla. How have interval funds generally performed over the first half of the year? It's been fairly similar when we take a look at interval funds overall. But we, I think it's best to focus on three different classifications. And the reason I say that is that's where the lion's share of interval funds are. For example, you know, if I were to do the developed equity fund group, developed market fund group, basically we only have three interval funds to 23. But if we look at kind of the three groups that I'm telling you about, real estate, general bond, and loan participation, I think we get a better idea on how they function on a year-to-date basis. Basically, real estate funds, and there's 34 interval funds in this group, 10 conventional closed-end funds, basically saw uh, or were able to mitigate losses better than their uh, counterparts. So the interval funds actually have suffered a 5.94% return year-to-date, while the standard or normal closed-end fund basically saw about a 20.73% decline. Now, we have to be careful on how we're evaluating these because, you know, funds uh, suffer these kind of roller coaster rides and, and they, they basically have daily nav day, uh, shifts and stuff and are traded on the market. But we take a look at the interval funds and they also have the ability to, do, let's say, invest in private assets. And so we might have to do with a mark-to-market type of uh, a different or transition. But when we take a look at general bond funds, there was actually a little bit of a degradation in returns if we compare to their counterparts. Basically, real, uh, global uh, global bond funds were able to mitigate losses to about the, the ten of about 6.83 percent, while their conventional uh, counterparts lost about 6.18 percent, so about 80 basis point difference there. But really, one of the areas that I think people have taken a look at recently is loan participation funds. I mentioned them in, uh, earlier in this segment. Basically, we saw a, kind of an equal grouping there. Loan participation funds that are interval funds are about 28 in number, and then we see that about 30 in account for uh, conventional closed-end funds. So the interval funds on the loan par side, and loan participation is the same thing as, if you will, bank loan funds, leverage loans, we just happen to call them loan participation. They actually mitigated losses, losing about 7.27%, but better than their counterparts who lost about 11.81%. So certainly interval funds have done a good job in some of the groups. But if we take a look at month to month, and I won't give you those numbers, but they're a little bit of different story. So they suffer illiquidity. I mean, so when they mark to market, you might see some bigger swings. So in June, we saw a little bit different numbers as far as uh, interval funds go. So I keep an eye on that, but certainly there are some great opportunities in the uh, interval fund space. So do you see advantages among interval funds for a particular type of investor at this stage of the market cycle? I think that when we're taking a look at people looking for yield, and I think that is most closed-end fund investors actually are looking for yield, we do have the opportunity. Uh, There's kind of a a tale of two cities here, uh, the other sides of a coin. 
if we take a look at this, obviously there's two things that they can get out of this. You usually can get a higher yield, but then you're putting on a little more risk. And in this market, we have to be concerned about that because of the choppiness that we've seen in uh, the market. One of the things we have as benefit, though, for looking at the fixed income side of the universe is there isn't really a lot of a place for the Fed to go to cut rates. Certainly spreads for uh, you know other instruments against the treasuries can widen a bit. But I do think there's opportunity if we have the ability to have a higher yield. And like I said, uh, the other side of the coin here, when we're taking a look at it, though, is that there is that illiquid issue to it. And a lot of times they're going into uh, non-rated or very low-rated securities as well. And uh, we have to be concerned with that risk that's being put on those portfolios. But again, I think there are some great opportunities in interval uh, hybrid funds here. Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Diane, thanks for having me. And we want to thank you for tuning in to another CEF Insights podcast. For more educational content, please visit our website at www.cefa.com.